Hey guys, today we'll take a walk through the Moscow center and take a look at some constructivist buildings completed in 1920s and 1930s. But now we're standing at the start of the old Arbat Street and looking at one of the seven sisters, the Staden skyscrapers, namely the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So why are we here? This building is not constructivist, it's neoclassical, and it was completed not in the 30s but in early 50s. But this building has a secret. Let's find out. The Seven Sisters were built mostly by so-called party architects, and this building is no exception. The party architects were the younger generation of Soviet architects who took political statements of the Communist Party as the guidance for the architectural style. Back in 1930s there was a confrontation between these party architects and the older generation of constructivist architects and uh, the party architects won it in the end. But funny enough, this large ministry building includes, as one of its wings, a pre-existing hotel built by a constructivist architect Ilya Golosov. Here it is. The bas relief depicts some guys riding a boat, some guys on bikes and some guys on skis. So who are all these folks? They're tourists, and this building was built for the tourist organization back in mid-30s. One can see that this is not a constructivist building, but neither is it neoclassical. It has the constructivism traits, it's composed of simple volumes, it's asymmetrical, and it has ribbon windows. But it also has rusticated base, a loggia with columns, and a bas relief, which are all classical traits. So that's the transitional style which was developed by the old architects back in the 1930s. It is sometimes called post-constructivism. Now, let's go back from 1935 to 1929 and go to see an avant-garde house, a personal residence of the architect Konstantin Melnikov. Melnikov wasn't exactly a constructivist. He had his own style and in late 1920s he built a lot of workers' clubs and garages. But by 1937 he was forced out of practice by the political forces and he never built anything again. His buildings are always very extravagant, very expressive uh, in terms of form, and so is, of course, his own house. There it is, with words Konstantin Melnikov, architect, written on it. It's like having your business card printed on a building. The house is composed of two interlocking cylinders. The side facing the street is cut by a big glass plane and the rest of the building is covered with hexagonal windows, so no matter where the sun is, it's always bright inside the house. Melnikov liked the idea of cylinder-shaped buildings because this form allowed to conserve heat and electricity for lighting. And he proposed cylindrical shapes for residential houses and for communal houses. But none of his projects in this field ever materialized. Maybe because they were too unusual, but probably because they simply were not very comfortable to live in. Melnikov himself uh, said that nobody in his family, neither he nor his wife nor their children, had any personal space, because the house consists of open spaces instead of normal rooms, and uh, that of course led to the tensions in the family. Today, the house is a museum of Melnikov and it offers some guided tours, so if you want to see the inside, you can come for a tour. Or you can just take a look at the model of the house in the yard. It presents the house with a vertical cutaway and you can see the architect's workshop in the back cylinder and the large living room in the forward cylinder. And you can probably note that there's really no personal rooms in the house. Nevertheless, it's a striking building, neither constructivist nor functionalist. It's just Melnikov's own style, where form often prevails over function. Now, let's go and see some more conventional houses of that period. 
It was a time when Moscow experienced a great housing shortage, but the resources to build were very limited. A lot of workers' housing estates were built with main concern for the construction to be cheap. But we are in the center of the city, and here the story is a bit different. This is a house built by Pantelemon Golosov, brother of Ilya Golosov, in 1930. It looks like a typical constructivist building with uh, not much to look at. It's uh, composed of simple volumes, no decoration whatsoever, and it has a glazed stairwell and some balconies which serve as accents on the otherwise featureless building. But as it was built for the military brass, not some workers, it had some pretty large flats, some of them with area over a hundred square meters, and at that time that was a lot. In fact, this whole house had only 18 flats. As far as I know, it was recently converted to commercial property, and for a constructivist building, that's not a bad thing, because more often they are simply demolished to make way for new residential housing or business property. So that house definitely got lucky. And now we're approaching another house that was completed in 1932 and it's called the Trefoil House because of its unusual plan. It also has a rare feature for Moscow. The first floor stands partly on piers there's only a couple buildings from that era in Moscow that have first floor and piers, and this is one of them. Otherwise, this building has all of the constructivist traits. The glazed stairwell, the horizontal lines, which emulate ribbon windows, of course, and it also has corner windows and corner balconies. This building was designed by Nikolai Ladovsky, leader of the rationalist movement, he was trying to create buildings that would have been not only functional as constructivist buildings were, but would also have psycho-organizational effect. So that's why he chose such a complex plan for this house. Now, let's skip some five years forward to 1938, when this building was completed. This was another time the constructivist movement was destroyed and the buildings were built to inspire inspire power, stability, energy and joy. And we see a symmetrical building with square windows and pilasters on the facade. But it's not neoclassical, it's only using the elements of the classical language, trying to interpret them in a new way. For example, see these half columns. They're not made in any classical order, they're just imitations. Let's go into the yard, see what's there. The buildings of that era often had only the front facade decorated and beautiful, and the back facade could be absolutely stripped of any decoration and could be even unplastered brick walls. But this house was evidently built on a big budget, because it has a neat back facade with pilasters and balconies. As you can see, this is a pretty big house, uh, and the buildings got bigger and bigger in 1930s to convey power and wealth of the state. So, from this big house, we'll go to see a small private one built in the 1920s in the next part. Thanks for watching.